This is the 16th message looking at the life and ministry of the famous Welsh Calvinistic Methodist exhorter, Mr. Hal Harris. Now, while there are other subjects we're going to return to this week, I view this as a very important message because we're going to stay on the mountaintops, if you will, or skip along the mountaintops. You know, until my dying day, I will always feel as if there's a great sense of urgency that we should all have. And one of my regrets is using 10 words and saying something that could have been said in five. I'll I'll always regret that. I'm just not good at doing that, unfortunately. But in this message, I'm going to try to do better. I want to keep it very short because of the importance of it, right? You know, if you're coming near the end of your life or there's a sense of urgency, you know, you got to convey a message right away. And at the end of Mr. Hal Harris's life, this is what was said about him. He found a nation slumbering. He left it awake. He found a nation slumbering. Those of you who have been listening for a while, or if you buy the two-volume set of the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist Fathers, there's a bishop who in like in the early 18th century, so I'm talking about like 1720s, described the spiritual state of Wells as saying the Lord's Day has become the devil's market day, that there were more murders and thefts and unspeakable crimes committed that day on Sunday than any other, any other day of the week. And that, um, that sin lost its shame and there's profound, or I'm sorry, not profound, but pro- profane works that were um, created and distributed freely. Um, you know, sin had lost its shame in wells during this time. This total darkness. One person would say you couldn't exaggerate how spiritually dark it was. That is the world in which Hal Harris was born in and grew up. And what was said about him at the end of his life? He found a nation slumbering. He left it awake. Mm, 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 mm. Let that be our aim as Christian people. Let us not worry about how big the task the Lord gives us. Let's just be faithful. Yes, let's go on those mission trips, but let's recognize every time we leave our homes, We are on the mission field. The people that we see every day, our friends, our neighbors, our family, the convenience store, the grocery store, our workplace, when we take walks along the park, this entire world is a mission field. And here's Hal Harris, an enthusiast, and God blesses his work. A man who is, um, you know, there are pastors who spend time on a Sunday morning um, feeling some need to say, you know, look at me, I'm a sinner just like you, and will spend times uh, telling their congregation all of their faults, you know, all their shortcomings and sins. And and I, I would think most of that is needless because congregations, they're mature adults. They recognize their pastors are sinners. And guess what? Hal Harris, he had his shortcomings. He had his pitfalls. He was a man. A mere man in the hands of God. And God elected to use him in a mighty way like others. There was a band of brothers, if you will, and sisters who also supported this great cause to save wells during the 18th century. These wonderful revivals, probably six or seven of them in total, would go on for close to a hundred years. And Hal Harris was an instrument of the Lord. And that's my point, in other words, why I'm not going to spend much time on Hal Harris's shortcomings. Uh-uh. No, I mean, for, for goodness sakes, Daniel Rowland uh, was not likely saved when he be- began to preach, right? <laughs> you know, and he was you know, committing sins after the service on a Sunday, just like his congregation. You know, why would God pick Daniel Rowland to use him in such a significant way? I have no idea. A flawed human being, just like Hal Harris. Why would God pick Hal Harris? I don't know. God is mysterious that way, and the instruments that he decides to use now, he uses them. But each one of us, as Christians, let it be said of this. He found a nation slumbering. He left it awake. 
let that be our aim as a Christian enthusiast for our Lord Jesus Christ, for Christ's sake, for his kingdom, for his glory. Let's advance his cause in a very dark, lost world. I just love that. There was a, a gentleman who said, Everywhere where the gospel is preached, there is no want of people to hear. And you, sir, referring to Hal Harris, through the favor of God's providence has been at the bottom of all of this. Let others say what they please, but God will do you justice if men will not. Indeed, the most part will own that you have been a great instrument of conversion. I believe this note or this, this letter was given to Hal Harris near the end of his life. Look at this. In God's providence, you, sir, are the bottom of all of this. Great organizer, great preacher. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Doesn't it just make your heart pound for Jesus, you know? Because you look at Hal Harris and you see Christ in him. His long-suffering, his patience, his humility. Mm. In another writing, it says, The work began by Mr. Jones, I think this is referring to Griffin Jones, the Anglican, spread itself far and near in South and North Wales, where the Lord has made Mr. Hal Harris an instrument of converting several clergy as well as laymen. <laughs> Here's Hal Harris going about preaching the gospel, yep, going up near and far. And the power of God at the sacraments under the ministry of Mr. Roland was enough to make a person's heart burn within him. And seven of the mornings have I seen perhaps 10,000 from different parts in the midst of sermon crying, ready to leap for joy. Hmm. So yes, indeed, there was a band of brothers. Yep. Whitfield, Wesley, Charles, Wesley, Griffin Jones, William Williams, and Daniel Rowland. Oh, there were ministers part in Germany and France and, and Scotland and Ireland as well. It was amazing. God was with them. And for Hal Harris, when you looked at a Christian, um, he was guided by reformers and the Puritans. It was life and power. That's what it meant to be a Christian. The life of God is in your soul. And that's how he would judge others, by the way, and himself. That he was a new creation in Christ. So this is really important. You might think, like... Hal Harris, the, the conflict is between, you know, what is truth and experience, right? So some denominations will emphasize experience, while other denominations will emphasize truth. And so the concern about truth without experience is that truth just becomes mechanical and cold, and there's no love for Jesus. And the problem with emphasizing experience is that experience could... You're not walking in spirit and truth. You're not, your, your imagination is getting away from you. So it's an absence of truth, right? So the concern, for example, might be eisegesis, where you're reading in your thoughts into the scriptures, which would lead you to denying truth and distorting truth. But at the same time, you could become a professor of Christianity and you're embracing the truth, but you, you have no power. If you're hard-pressed, your anger, pride, selfishness, self-righteousness, all these things come out of you and you just justify yourself because there's certain facts that you know about God and you think you hold it on to those facts that you know it. So yes, the Calvinistic Methodists are embracing truth and experience. That's true, but that's not what Hal Harris was worried about or not the main thing. I'm sure he was worried about it, but not the main thing. And, and hold on, this is the main thing. That's why I want to keep this message short. What he was concerned about was an active, living faith now, today. 
not tradition. That's what Hal Harris was concerned about, and many others. Are you relying on tradition in history? Or is your faith active and alive today? Hmm. When's the last time you ever heard anybody say that to you? I, 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 maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just not listening very well. But I think that's a very powerful one because it just made me think about all the scriptures. Like you can go to Colossians chapter three, right? All the times that Paul says we're in Christ, right? We're alive in Christ, right? We're we're to think about heavenly things. Where he says right here in beginning with verse two, chapter three, set your minds. Um, on things that are above, not on the things on the earth, to put it in the negative, and now the positive, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Yes, right? Think Christ said he came into this world to bring us life. And so what is Hal Harris worried about? Concerned about? Hey, is your faith active and alive today? Are you just resting on some experience that you had, you know, 20 years ago? And that, by the way, that experience is important. When you came to Christ and you confessed him and you confessed your sins and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that, by all means, that date should be remembered. I'm not, but the point, though, is we don't rest on tradition or history. What we want to know is about ourselves and help one another. Is our faith active and alive today? And so while there's this great debate between, you know, what are you emphasizing, truth or experience? Well, it, well, the Christianity teaches it's both. But the main thing, the plain thing, is your faith active and alive today? Mm -mm 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 -mm. I, I, I think Harris has a point here. I think this is something we need to listen to. Yes, indeed. In this life and power, how would you, like, describe Methodism, you know? Because even the author who wrote these um, lectures on the significance, I'm reading the lecture now, The Significance of Enthusiasm, even says, you know, it was kind of hard to describe Methodism because people who adhered to the Methodist approach, you know, would sometimes not just become Calvinistic Methodists, but they would, like, become Anglicans. They were the Baptists. They were Presbyterians. The Moravians, as an example, right? Um, so... It was sometimes hard to even like define what was happening within them, but I would define it, I think the best way, is the way Hal Harris defines it, which is, you're alive now. And because you're alive, you have a burning urgency. Your faith is aflamed. You have love and power and simplicity. Uh, mu must and truth have been difficult to resist. Yes, that's how it's being described. So. The, this work that God is doing in people, well, there's a burning urgency of, of faith of, of flame, such love and power and such simplicity. And when people were seeing these things, these works of God, this um, in this letter it's pointing out that it was very difficult to resist. Well, I'm fast approaching the 14-minute mark. In order to keep my promise now, I, I, I need to bring this to an end. Um, but the, um, uh, but the way that I want to bring it in, that what I want to emphasize is just, we should have the same, thing, the same goal as Hal Harris. Oh, this nation, we found it slumbering, but we left it awake. Amen. Let us evaluate, is our faith active and alive today? And let Hal Harris be an example for us to follow, to be an enthusiast. And if that makes you feel un uncomfortable, well, then follow the enthusiasm of Apostle Paul. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, then follow the enthusiast of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read this now, and then we're done. Light and faith, as Harris puts it in the last message, are two things many have the former that know nothing of the latter. To view and speak of Christ and to possess him are two things, Harris says. In his dying testimony, Harris also repeats his sense of the preacher's calling not to speak of what we have had from the Lord, but what we have now afresh from him. Mm. 
In his dying testimony, Harris also repeats his sense of the preacher's calling, not to speak of what we have from the Lord, but what we have now, afresh and anew. Well, until next time, grace upon grace be with you all. Thank you.